report on the first slide. And uh, so I'm Jonathan Downey, founder and CEO of Airware. We're a venture-backed startup company that has developed a platform for small commercial UAS. And uh, basically we want to, uh, and you can find out a lot about our products and stuff on our website and product literature, but I wanted to, uh, if you're interested, provide you the opportunity with kind of some background information on myself and, and how we came to start Airware, why, and kind of what our platform is about. And also we have enough time for a Q&A at the end to uh, get any of your questions answered. First time I was at an AWSI event was actually a student uh, UAS competition when I was an undergraduate at MIT. And uh, that was about eight years ago now. So it's, uh, it's great to be back in the AWSI event. Um, this is actually myself from eight years ago at that student UAS competition. So it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here today and to, uh, to share about Airware. And it's been really exciting to see the changes in the industry between uh, then and now. At the time that I was a student and involved in that competition, most of the small UAS being used were using black box autopilots. Um, you connected the servos to them, you connected the daily to them, everything was very proprietary. And what we saw in academia and being students who wanted to try new things is that if you wanted to hook up a sensor that wasn't developed by the same company as the autopilot or wasn't really meant to be connected to the autopilot, you really had your hands tied in a lot of ways. What a lot of students ended up doing was adding another external flight computer, writing a lot of this kind of blue logic and software interface with the autopilot, probably adding a second data link to the aircraft, and then adding some of the sensors to that. So they ended up either doing a lot of the integration work themselves, or they ended up really kind of having their hands tied and, and were stuck working with the, the single vendor that made the autopilot. And in both cases, it was almost impossible to modify a lot of the software running on the autopilot if you wanted to do any interesting flight controls work, modify commission software, and things that were happening when the UAS system got to a waypoint or was looking at a, at a target with a camera. And so this really added to our frustration as students, and we saw the need for something other than a black box solution uh, at the time. Uh, other alternatives, of course, are developing the whole thing yourself scratch. And as some pretty audacious students, we thought that might be a good idea. Um, there's of course all kinds of problems associated with that, having to roll your own electronics. I think by the time um, we had designed our whole system, it was very complex. Uh, we tried to design it in a way where if we got any single element of it wrong, we could fix that element without redesigning the whole system again. So it was a very distributed, endlessly modifiable architecture. And by the time we finished building it, I think half of it was obsolete. So there are a lot of lessons that we learned um, by doing that. And when I graduated, I went on to work at Boeing, at what was essentially a startup program there. It was acquired by Boeing on the A160T program. There was a really great first job out of school. I got to see both the uh, world of big aerospace, but also what an aerospace startup might look like. There I had a chance to work on hardware, flight control software, autonomous mission software, and also be involved in a lot of flight testing of a 6,000 pound fully autonomous helicopter. Spending days out in the desert and ground control station with 12 other people um, and, and really got to be involved in a lot of that. By the way, all of our flight testing was done at, or most of our flight testing was done at a public airport in the national airspace system. So that was an interesting aspect of it as well. Um, at that program, we went on to break the world record for longest endurance helicopter flight of 18.7 hours, and we also demonstrated slow mo cargo delivery autonomously. There, I learned a lot of lessons lessons about aerospace in general, um, but especially about an aerospace startup. One of the things I learned is that if software is difficult to change in your system, at some point, software does not get changed. As you implement new features and the complexity of your software grows, you start to reach that point where your software becomes stale. People don't want to make modifications, and modifications become seen as risk factors. So these are all lessons that we've kind of kept in mind as we moved on in our careers. Another problem that we saw was that if you develop 
your product specifically for kind of one end customer. And the A160 was developed a while for DARPA uh, and then for specific SOCOM customers. When you develop your product for a specific customer, um, you really get a lot of your architecture locked into things that that customer wants. And uh, it's not great for your long term architecture development. Likewise, with adding payloads over time rather than building the infrastructure for those payloads from the beginning. Um, another thing that we found was really important for us is to focus on reliability and maintainability of both the software and the system from the very beginning and put a lot of dedication and resources into that. The last thing for me personally I found to be one of the biggest lessons, and that is that the speed of iteration that you're able to do on a product is one of the biggest driving factors to how innovative your product can end up being. So if you can close the loop on that quickly, you can really end up with a very innovative product. As much as I love developing UAS systems, after doing it for a number of years, I, uh, I thought I might try something different, and I wanted a little break and a chance to uh, flex my skills as a man pilot. So I took a job at uh, Grand Canyon Airlines flying the Havilland Twin Otter, uh, which was really fun. <laughs> Uh, it was interesting, we mainly did flights from, the Grand Can from Las Vegas to the Grand Canyon, many times eight flights a day, in challenging winds, and ironically with no autopilot at all. <laughs> so after a few months of, of hot afternoons in the cockpit and getting paid $12 an hour, I thought, it's probably not what I'm going to do forever. And we revisited this problem that we had identified as undergraduates at MIT. And interestingly, five years later, the problem still existed in pretty much the same fashion. With the biggest difference being that at the time when we were undergraduates, there was no kind of commercial market emerging. The military was the main user and purchaser of small UAS systems, and they were using them largely for a single mission type. But we saw that with an emerging commercial market, UAS systems were going to be used for a wide variety of applications, and it would be impossible for the autopilot maker to anticipate all of the uses, build all of that software into the product from the very beginning. And so what was needed was something that was much more of a development platform, something that could be extended, and something that the end customers and other developers in the space could really build upon. So we believe this is the solution. It's something we've been working on for a number of years. It's a highly customizable, but very integrated product. Um, and it's our, our series of auto products. It's meant to be a platform level solution for commercial UAS. It's designed to run across all different types of vehicles and to be used for all different types of end uses and missions. Where the very high level of software is modifiable for each of these end missions and applications without the need for doing all of the costly hardware integration of products from different vendors or self. Because one size did not always fit all, we've designed it in three different form factors. It's all running essentially the same software. So if you modify the software, write an add-in, write an uh, extension to our API, it'll run across all the different vehicle types seamlessly. We have a, a larger form factor autopilot with a shielded metal enclosure for aircraft that require that, typically aircraft with gas engines and such. We have one that's designed specifically for multi-rotor vehicles and then one designed for your smallest um, vehicles. It's like 40 grams. For UAS solution providers, this is a great solution because it requires minimal integration work on your part. It enables the tailoring of your complete solution for a specific market or application that you're going after so that you can really focus on your customer needs and the customer needs that are specific in that market and application. It also focuses on safety, reliability, and maintainability of both the software running on the autopilot as well as the end system. And there's integration and application engineering support available to your organization. For developers and partners, anyone from developing either camera systems to gimbals to just pieces of software that they'd like to run on some of these small UAS systems, there's an API that enables this customization, and it's done in a way where you can create the intellectual property and own that intellectual property moving forward. We shield developers from the specifics of hardware 
and certain vehicle configurations so that you can write software that will be used across a wide variety of different vehicles. And it allows for nearly any payload or sensor on the market, and even ones being developed now and in the future, to be integrated into the system. Again, the developments supported by full-time aerospace professionals on our end, or from other vendors or your own company, the options are really limitless there. For UAS businesses, whether you're focused on providing services or a new product, use of our platform is really priced for the commercial market. It's free of ITAR restrictions, meaning that your products can be sold essentially worldwide. And there's a growing, greater and greater industry-wide ecosystem of partners who are working with us. So that when you are building on top of our platform, other people are building on top of the same platform as well and adding capabilities to your system. And there's professional support and engineering services if you need us. Here's some of the vehicles that are flying the Airware Air platform today from companies in France like Delta Drone with their multi rotor vehicle to uh, UAV Solutions in Maryland with their Talon. Some of this is a little bit of a, a, a teaser. We're going to be having uh, rolling out more information and details on the Airware API at AUDSI North America in a couple of weeks. So we hope to see you all there. We'll also be making some, uh, some key announcements about partnerships in the space. These partnerships are going to be greatly expanding the Airware platform and the ecosystem and the value offering to people using the platform. So we hope to see you there. Before I go into Q&A, I wanted to add that our team is growing a lot. And so if you're here because you're passionate about UAS systems, and you're looking for a way to be involved in the industry in an exciting, fast-growing company, Airware is a great company to consider. So feel free to come talk to me after the session. It's time to be glad to open up to uh, certainly seeing 
a, a, at least a bit of a shift in mentality where they want for there to be commercial products in this space. Uh, and you know, we're pretty involved with them in terms of saying, you know, this is a feature we're thinking about, maybe this isn't, and you know, where's the line in the sand that you guys consider this a, a military Department of Defense capability um, versus not. Um, so we're pretty involved in that process. I don't expect that that would happen. Sensors, with the exception of AGL sensors and the antenna for GPS, are all integrated into the product. So, gyros, accelerometers, magnetometer, pressure sensors. And so, follow up question: What do you do to up with the advancement of that technology? Well, one of the things that we're doing is by providing these APIs, we essentially shield hardware changes from the companies who are using our product. And so, if if a year from now we upgrade to the latest and greatest, um, it's not going to change the software you've developed for the autopilot. You don't have to deal with you know low level uh, drivers and things like that. Hopefully, it's only kind of adding more features over time or uh, greater levels of uh, accuracy. So your product is not open source anyway. Um, we provide some software open source to our customers. It's not community developed. Thank you so much for having me.